recognize the gentleman from the Kansas City, Missouri area, the soon-to-be Super Bowl champs, Kansas City Chiefs, my fellow delegation member, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you for that opening objective uh, analysis uh, of the coming game. I was um, going to ask uh, Ms. Howe, uh, before you, you said anything about uh, the, the, the game, um, and um, it doesn't mean we're bragging uh, about anything. Um, you know, if you win, you're not bragging. Uh, and, and so we, we are hoping that the rest of the me committee members uh, will come in and celebrate at the next hearing uh, the Kansas City uh, Chiefs as world champions. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm glad we have some folk who, who've taken advantage of, of this. I, I, uh, I, I've been on this committee 18 years, but I've, this is my first time on the capital market. So, and, and trying to get up to speed on it, I, it, I mean, I, I thought, people are going to run away. I mean, uh, um, it, a, a shareholder of record does not denote uh, the current owner of stock. Instead, it suggests who owned it two days prior. Now, if you tell I mean, somebody's, you know, wanting to, to, to participate, go into business, uh, won't they start out getting a headache? I mean, am I, did I, did I, am I interpreting that correctly? Is that, is that correct? I, I think there's a misunderstanding here. A shareholder of record for public companies, it is true that often on a, a central ledger system called CD, multiple shareholders are centralized as one shareholder for purposes of calculating for proxy rules under the public law, uh, company laws. For private companies, that's not really accurate. It's one-to-one. -one. I, I think if you ask any of the entrepreneurs or venture people here, you will find that the shareholders that are listed on their uh, record holders are, are their record holders. And so while I can't say that is true in all cases, I can say it's in the predominance of case. And so the concern that I have when I hear questions like that, if that's the route that the SEC intends to use to force private companies to go public is by playing games with 12G, I think that's, that's problematic. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, Ms. Howe and uh, Ms. Gladney, um, can you um, speak to the challenge, challenges in fundraising for startup companies, uh, particularly those uh, who are pre-revenue, uh, thereby make, making uh, uh, bank capital largely inaccessible? Uh, thanks for the question, Chair, uh, Congressman. Definitely the pre-revenue stage was the most challenging stage for us. Um, and again, not being an insider, you go to the websites of a lot of these investment firms that will say, hey, we invest at day zero. So we're like, hey, we're at day zero. And we try pitching and, and come to find out more than likely they, they definitely they don't. Or it's, it's not for people who look like me or people who um, don't have that existing connection. Um, and so it's, it's extremely challenging, which is why it, it tends to put a lot of founders like um, Angela and I in a corner where it's either we let this, die, um, this idea die or we, f we pull out money that we probably shouldn't pull out to make it work. Um, once we get the revenue in, at least we can start saying we have traction and it mitigates some of the risk and you'll start to see more people come. But it's still even challenging at that, that point for, for founders like myself. I'll let Darcy kind of chime in before time runs out. Pre-revenue companies are the purview of angels. Angels are more predominant in markets where they're, they've already made money and they're quite, uh, they're quote, on house money. So they can afford to take the risk of giving twenty or $30,000 to Angela and uh, Deborah. So I don't think that's the right place for early, early investors, frankly. Um, that's the place for people who are more sophisticated and who can help these young, young, young companies, um, if that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield back. 